The stories in the book of Genesis have drawn considerable attention recently. Millions have watched Hillsdale College's Genesis series on YouTube, and tens of millions have watched Jordan B. Peterson's The Psychological Significance of the Biblical Stories. And Peterson's best-selling book, 12 Rules for Life, draws upon Genesis quite heavily, um, and that sold millions of copies. And for good cause. The ancient stories are rich with densely packed layers of meaning. Many people over many generations have spent countless hours unpacking the lessons in the Garden of Eden, the Flood, Cain and Abel, and the like. In 2018, Matthew Peugeot added his book, The Language of Creation, Cosmic Symbolism in Genesis, to the long shelf of commentators. Peugeot covers topics like man as the cosmic mediator between heaven and earth, the relationship of time and space, and the fractal-like patterns of symbolism. Ultimately, Peugeot writes on page four, the goal of this commentary is to not to bridge the gaps between the material and spiritual perspectives, but to rediscover the lost spiritual worldview and to interpret the Bible accordingly. So if you're the type of person that asks the questions, what do the stories in Genesis really mean? How do I read the Bible in the correct context? How does symbolism work? Then Peugeot's language of creation is a good read in that direction. In this video, I will review the background and structure of Matthew Peugeot's work. So stay tuned for videos covering deeper discussions about the content. What do we know from Matthew Peugeot's background? What we know is from videos published on his brother Jonathan's YouTube channel, The Symbolic World. Jonathan is an icon maker in the Orthodox Church and teacher on symbolism. What we do know from these videos is that Matthew went to the University of Montreal where he was frustrated by what he called the subversion of religion in his major of religious studies. He also made a video with his brother and Jordan Peterson where we learned that Jordan Peterson leaned upon the brothers Peugeot to draw upon Dostoevsky during his biblical lecture series mentioned earlier. Uh, the brothers Peugeot answer Peterson's questions and critique his interpretations. Aside from this, we don't know a whole lot. Uh, he has a handful of YouTube videos and he's published this one book. He's somewhat of a, a, a new figure on the scene. He's not a, 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 a prominent theologian, maybe like Alistair Roberts or uh, David Bentley Hart, someone like this. Uh, he's somewhat of a mysterious figure to draw upon Genesis. He's like a Melchizedek. He just drops into the scene and he has some important things to point out and to, to say and to clarify with some bold predictions and, and calls as well. I mean, he's really calling us to get out of our modern worldview and into the cosmological worldview of the Bible or of creation. That's a pretty big, big ask. And so in a sense, it's like, who is this guy? And just even already we're impacted by what little we know about his background. Let's get into it, guys. The cover, language of creation. We see here that we have the text, language of creation. The subtitle is cosmic symbolism in Genesis and a sub subtitle of a commentary. We also see that there's a map or illustration. Here we can see the, the snake eating its own tail or the um, Ouroboros. It also has the cosmic tree in the center. We can see that there's the, the dualism, if you will, of the white and the dark, dark blue, or the light and the darkness. And we have the author's name. And of course, in the back here too, we have just a description of the text. There really isn't things that you would find with the books on the, the popular most or most read shelf of Barnes and Noble, let's say, of, of people praising the, the high achievement of the author or anything like that. I mean, it's already we know before we even open that that this is a pretty straightforward book. There's not a whole lot of glitz and glamour, and it's probably going to get straight to the point. All right, here we go. Let's take a look inside. Now, the first page where we usually find a long list of all of the publisher's informations and the copyright infringement and all of these other things, we find this. Oh, sorry, see if you can 
view that properly. Really, all what it says is copyright 2018, Matthew Bridget, all rights reserved in the ISBN number. This is a self-published book. So we don't have a lot of the other things we're expecting, which has its pluses and minuses. Uh, its minuses is that really this thing is from the hip and whatever he wanted to say, he said it. So there's not a whole lot of, of chairs or councils to go through a, a vetting process that said, yeah, this is definitely worth publishing and it's legitimate and he's checked his sources and all of these other things. And the plus is that, hey, it's from the hip. So whatever this author wanted to communicate, he's communicating straight from him to the reader. Also, it, it communicates that he's pretty bold about it. He's like, I don't care if people publish this thing or not. I think it's worth you reading. Next, we have a dialogue between Esau and Jacob from the text in Genesis, kind of as a teaser to get you intrigued as to what we're going to do. You're not quite sure why he's saying it at this point. Table of context, uh, there's 84 chapters. And then uh, an introduction where he writes the thesis of why he's writing this book and what he's going to be covering. I've written this commentary to provide the reader with the necessary tools to interpret the Bible from its own cosmological perspective instead of the materialistic paradigms of modern science. There you have it. That's what he's going to be proving and elaborating upon in the body of the text. Now the structure is divided up into several parts. Part one is entitled Salvaging Creation from the Scientific Worldview. It's really is distinguishing that there's an ancient way of viewing the world and a modern or scientific way. And so he explains that this is in fact a salvation or salvation a salvaging operation that he's undertaking okay now the next parts parts two through five cover heaven and earth and the biblical cosmology and as well as on the human scale and then time and space in biblical cosmology and on the human scale he's describing how this ancient worldview functions and he's uh, reappropriating it. He's trying to explain it in a way that we would understand. And then finally, he concludes with how the ancient and scientific world views can reconcile, or even how this cosmological, biblical worldview transcends the scientific worldview. What he's doing in creating this, this structure through the various parts is that he's, he's creating a bookend where as you could probably pick up part one, the first part and the last part are th it's the same topic. So where he begins, he also ends. This is following close to the pattern of, that we find on the cover logo, which is again, the snake eating its own tail and the cosmic tree, where the head is the worldviews of the biblical cosmology from that of the scientific, but then he goes through the body of the snake or the text describing heaven and earth, and then describing time and space, and overall the, the cosmological worldview, and then it ends with how this worldview can transcend that of the modern scientific worldview. So where we begin, we end, and it creates this looping pattern. And it also, just by understanding the structure and also how this illustration functions, he's creating a pattern that he remains consistent throughout. Also notice the sub subheading. Again, it says a commentary. Now, I'll warn you folks, this is not a typical commentary. This is not the one that I'm familiar with. For example, a few verses on the top of the text followed by a whole lot of interpretation and commentary below. And it's a really big book that covers a very a smaller portion of a text that it's going over. That's not what we have here. So this is not a verse by verse commentary. It's more thematic where he introduces the heading of the chapter and he lets you know what he's gonna be covering. And then he uses the text to describe and to draw out this worldview as a whole. Another quite unique 
aspect of this book is that there are the maps and the illustrations. They draw your attention to understand the movement and the shapes that he's drawing you into. I found these to be quite helpful, that they illuminated the meaning and they help focus the reader like lenses on glasses that you, you narrow your focus into this worldview. I had some growing pains going through this worldview, so these maps really helped me understand what he was trying to say. You also can be quite dependent on them. As you can tell, there's, there's one chapter that ends on page 288 that he gives a block of text and then he just ends and makes his point with a map or an illustration like, Yep, this sums it up. You should be able to understand pretty much everything just by uh, inferring it from this map. The chapters are pretty short. They're about four pages in length. I found them to be quite difficult to read with any sort of momentum. I disagree with Alistair Roberts' overview and review of this book. He found that this structure of the short chapters allowed him to read easily and quickly. Boy, that was not the case with me, you guys. I found that it slowed me way down. Uh, I also pointed out here a few sections where he could have amalgamated several chapters into a single chapter, a more of a standard length. So, for example, in chapter 45, the creator of space and time, it could be combined with chapters 46, 7, and 8 that serve as examples to chapter 45 uh, into a single chapter of 16 pages. As a secondary example, chapters 19 through 24, I felt like could have been brought into 20 pages or more of a standard length of a chapter that we would come to expect from other texts. But I don't think that he wanted them to be a, a standard length. Or he didn't want his readers to be reading this with fluidity to just breeze on by it. I, I think the structure of his chapters, as well as the, the, the dense sentences that he writes and the maps, they really, they slowed me way down. And I think that he did this on purpose to forcefully slow us down to appropriate this new worldview. Because for someone that doesn't study symbolism a whole lot, it, it takes some getting used to. Like when I first started out, man, I was so frustrated because I tried to just blow through it and it was like, yeah, I'll just skim it. Yeah, well, these dense sentences and short chapters are a skimming killer. They don't allow you to do that, or at least they didn't allow me. And it's kind of like the people that prepare meals in a certain way that force you to eat your food slowly. He's doing that with how he laid out his text and his chapters. Underneath the headings of each chapter is somewhat of a, a central text. I wasn't sure, I'm pretty sure most of them were from the scriptures. Uh, I, they were not cited. And I found this to be kind of frustrating because I wanted to know, I wanted to follow along with the, the biblical text as well. And I found that I was searching all around to try to find what the heck he was doing. And then later he talks about it, maybe at the end of the chapter or sometime throughout, but a little bit confusing. Maybe in the second edition, he includes what chapter and verse right from the get go. Also, I wasn't sure which translation he was using, uh, which, I found to be somewhat of a stumbling point because I couldn't follow along word for word. And also it kind of brings in that question of legitimacy. It's like, is he just doing this based on his own translations? Like, where is he really drawing these things from? Which brings up the other question I had, sources. It's, it's not like he's drawing upon many, many verses of the Bible and saying, yep, that's all I'm using. There's obviously some other information and some learning that he did in order to produce this book. Uh, but when I went to turn to the work cited page, I found this. Nada. He doesn't really refer to any other work. And there's some simple negatives to this. I mean, like for someone like me that wants to learn more about this topic, he doesn't really give you that next piece of, or the next clue along the trail to have you learn and to grow and to make a fuller idea of what he's drawing upon. But then in a more serious sense, a negative would be that there's a legitimacy is issue to what he's saying. 
is he just making these things up willy nilly or is he copywriting someone is he just stealing these ideas i'm not really sure this just based on the structure again not having a work cited it tells me that this is not a, a scientific book if you will nor is it going to be something that is uh, purely academic or to the same rigor that would be sub, uh, that would be offered to like a scholarly journal or anything like that. So for all of you that are intrigued by symbolism or perhaps you're a little bit frustrated by having a purely literalistic way of viewing the Bible, this is a great book to start. I can tell you, even just going over the structure, hopefully you have an idea that this author has something weighty to go through and that this mysterious text is, is going to draw you into a perspective that leaves you in a place where you are challenged by how you see the world, which is always an exciting process, whatever you're getting into, be it videos or, or reading or YouTube teachings, whatever it is. So I hope this is helpful and stay tuned for future videos where we dig into the discussion of the content. I drew upon some of the, the chatter that's happening in the Facebook group called Symbolic World in the Zombie Apocalypse. Uh, send an invite to join the conversations around points of symbolism as well as the Brothers Peugeot's work, among others. To support this channel, please click the subscribe button to stay up to date with future work as well as clicking the like button. Leave a comment below, let me know what you think of the book or any questions that you might have. You can support the channel in other ways by clicking the links below. Hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you next time.